welcome everyone um, to the last lecture of Expanding the Boundaries. This is actually really crazy. Um, I am Sophia and together with Maddie, we have organized this month long lecture series. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to everyone who has joined us in all the previous lectures as well. Um, before we get started, we would like to invite you to turn on your videos throughout the lecture. Give us a little bit more of a sense that we're together here. Um, also, Maddie and I have added our pronouns next to our name. So please feel free to do the same. This will come in handy, especially during the Q&A. Um, if you want to do this, you just click on your, like your camera, like where you see yourself and then on the three dots and then select rename and then it can easily be adjusted. Um, if you have any uh, questions during the lecture, feel free to unmute yourself or put the question in the chat. And otherwise you can also save your question for the end uh, for during the Q&A. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Maddie. Thank you so much for being here and for supporting Sophia and I through the lecture series. Uh, today we introduce you to Greg Newton. Greg is the co-founder with his partner Donnie of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division and Greg and Donnie launched their independent all-volunteer queer cultural center bookstore and event space in New York City in 2012. Uh, they moved the project to its current home in Manhattan's the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender Community Center in 2014 and we will now hear from Greg and I'll pass it to you. All right, thank you. thank you so much, Sophia and Maddie. Um, so I'm gonna share with you a little PowerPoint uh, and talk to you about the history of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which as Maddie said, uh, I co-founded with my partner, Donnie Jokum in 2012. So first off, I'll say why we started this. Uh, we began to imagine opening a queer bookstore in the fall of 2011. Uh, Craig, Red, Craig Rodwell had established the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop in New York City in 1967. That was the first gay and lesbian bookstore in the US and it survived until 2009. A different light bookstore in New York City opened in 1983 and closed in 2001. So it was in the fall 2011 when we were walking where a different light bookstore used to be and we suddenly realized that there was no longer an LGBT bookstore in New York. Um, there were other kinds of activists, leftist bookstores, feminist bookstores, but not one that was specifically focused on queer people and queer topics. So we said, why don't we do it? And we were half joking, but increasingly we took it seriously. <laughs> um, just to give you some background about myself, I was pursuing a doctorate degree at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And uh, my focus was on the emergency, the emergence, not emergency, of monochrome painting in 1950s New York. And I was also teaching at Parsons, the new school for design. Um, I started in 2004 and 2006, I was full-time. And uh, in the last couple of years, when I was there, I got to teach a course that I created, which related to my disserta dissertation topic. And that was called The Ready-Made, The Grid, and The Monochrome, Repetition and Originality in the Art of the Avant-Garde and Its Successors. And I'm mentioning that to you because uh, it relates to my interests uh, that I'm gonna be talking about with regard to the Bureau. So I was interested in critiques of originality, the artist as a unique individual genius master, uh, critiques of connoisseurship of craft, technique, the fetishizing of the artist's touch, and radical questioning of definitions of art and the processes by which art is deemed legitimate and authentic. So this issue of legitimacy was very central to our thinking about the Bureau um, as we got started and continues to be this day. So how does the discourse of legitimacy and the binary oppositions that structure it pertain to art and to people? So I'm talking here about the oppositions of legitimacy versus criminality, authenticity versus fraudulence, originality versus repetition, 
sincerity versus affectation, the serious versus the frivolous, the straightforward versus the misleading, the valuable versus the worthless. So these kinds of binarisms interested me in art, but it was also central to my interests uh, with regard to the bookstore. Of course, queer people have historically been identified by the dominant culture as criminal, as illegitimate, insane, inauthentic, frivolous, ridiculous, not trustworthy, subject to blackmail, deceitful, unspeakable, and unworthy of empathy. So we've been on the, the not so good side of uh, legitimacy. And in 2011, 12, when we were first thinking of this project and imagining it, it's important for me to remind you that in the United States, there were at the time that the major LGBT organizations were really focused on, on three goals. One was making gay marriage, so-called gay marriage, legal throughout the country. Another was to enact hate crime laws, laws that specifically targeted people for committing crimes against uh, people of specific marginalized identities. And uh, gays in the military. So the desire to uphold these three very conservative institutions, marriage, uh, the criminal justice system, and the military. So Ryan Conrad was the founder of a collective called Against Equality, which published these three little books I'm showing you. And uh, just a brief statement from him, he said, we must fight the rhetoric of equality and inclusion in systems of domination like marriage and the military and stop believing that our participation in those institutions is more important than questioning those institutions' legitimacy altogether. So our question at that point was, do we queer people just want to participate in the dominant institutions of power in our society? Do we just want to seat at the table, representation within the power structure as it now stands? Have we rejected the utopian visions of liberation in favor of the pragmatic goals of assimilation. Now I'm including a quotation that's uh, a little out of the chronology. It's from 2016, 2016, but it's important to this discussion, so I'm including it now. Um, Sarah Schulman, someone I'll talk about a bit later, but an important writer and activist in New York. Uh, she wrote a book called Conflict is Not Abuse in 2016, and in that she says, we have learned over and over again through the almost mechanistic co-optation of a wide range of radical movements and disenfranchised communities that as long as the system of domination and power remains intact, winning rights or realignment in the hierarchy simply means that the most normative elements of any community gain access to the state apparatus. When that happens, the least powerful elements remain the objects of their force. So, we were looking at the ways that uh, LGBT organizations were actually propping up these very conservative institutions and oppressive institutions uh, by joining them um, somewhat uncritically. And what I'm sharing with you now is a quote from Jose Esteban Munoz, his book Cruising Utopia from 2009, and it's my favorite definition of queerness. Uh, he says, queerness is essentially about the rejection of a here and now, and an insistence on potentiality or concrete possibility for another world. My argument is, my argument is interested in critiquing the ontological certitude that I understand to be partnered with the politics of presentist and pragmatic contemporary gay identity. So that gives you a sense of our, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of our anti assimilation anti-assimilationist project, um, rejecting the idea that we should assimilate to the dominant culture. So you might ask, why give this utopian anti-assimilationist project a name like Bureau of, General Service, Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which suggests a state agency? Um, typically, I'm showing you the cover of Smash the Church, Smash the State, the early years of gay liberation. That's typically what we think of when we think of queer culture as opposition, as oppositional, as challenging the state, as challenging the dominant institutions. But that had clearly changed by around, at least in the US, by around 2010. Um, so why did we give it this name? 
there were many reasons, uh, which I'll now go into. One, we wanted to provoke thinking about where we are as queer individuals, communities, and organizations, and what kind of future we want for ourselves. Uh, we wanted to explore the tension between our historical position as outsiders, challenging the powers that be, and our relatively new roles as legibly queer agents within the current power structures. We wanted to imagine what would it mean to have our own agencies, divisions, and departments within governments that remain dedicated to capitalist exploitation, private corporate power, and rule by military and police violence, and the ever-present threat of violence and incarceration. Now on the positive side, I would say we were embracing the notion of legitimizing ourselves, of declaring ourselves a bureau that was legitimate because we said so. Um, so recognizing our innate legitimacy, as opposed to looking to the state or other institutions of the dominant culture to grant us legitimacy, as if it was theirs to give or to withhold. We wanted to celebrate the ways that queers, people of color, women, indigenous peoples, the poor, laborers, asylum seekers, immigrants, the disabled, and other marginalized populations have challenged their oppressors and rejected definitions of themselves as inferior to white, heterosexual, property-owning, able-bodied cis men. And we very much hoped and continue to hope to inspire others to claim their legitimacy and to take action. Um, uh, ours is very much a do-it-yourself project. We encourage, we hope we inspire others to do similar things. And as the years progress, we've started calling ourselves a governmental agency of a government that does not yet exist as a way of emphasizing that this is a utopian project, that it's a project that urges us to imagine the bureaucracies and governments of our dreams and longings. We have always wanted to serve as infrastructure for the queer community. So even though we're kind of playful with the name, uh, we sincerely want to serve as infrastructure. So some sources of inspiration for this name and our aesthetics, uh, which we frequently get asked about. Um, first of all, I'll say that Donnie and I, um, I grew up in Connecticut, Donnie grew up in Louisiana, New Orleans, and uh, we were very much into 1980s pop music and very influenced by bands. And so when we were thinking of a name for this bookstore, we also thought about the bands we loved from the 80s, bands with very corporate or institutional sounding names like the Human League, Kraftwerk, the Style Council, Public Image Limited, Joy Division, New Order, etc. So we love those, those bands and their, their very official sounding names. Um, I was very inspired by, uh, I don't know if you guys know the band Leibach. It's a Slovenian band, but they're part of an artist collective in Ljubljana, uh, the capital of Slovenia. And that artist collective is called Neue Slovenische Kunst. And they've, they very much play with the, the look Book of legitimacy, the paraphernalia of the state. I even have my own little passport to this conceptual state, uh, which I got many years ago, which I love because it's very much like a real passport. But, but yeah, it's a conceptual passport. It's a nation with no land. So that was also a source of inspiration. The Russian avant-garde was also a source of inspiration because of its utilitarian aesthetics and its utopian aspirations. And here I'm showing you uh, Rodchenko's Workers Club from the Soviet Pavilion in 1925 at the Art Deco exhibition. And when you see some of the pictures of the Bureau, you'll see uh, what we take from this. Uh, I was also inspired, uh, given my history in, um, with art history, by institutional critique, especially the artist Marcel Brodeurs. Um, I'm showing you photos from when he launched his Musée d'Art Moderne, his own museum, uh, in 1968, which was in his apartment. And it was a museum without an art collection, featuring postcards of famous artworks and shipping crates, which are both signifiers of art circulation, both as reproduction and as objects. So I loved his highlighting of the bureaucracies that frame and legitimize art, the infrastructure of the art world. Also, I was interested in conceptual art, which you know kind of blurs in with institutional critique, 
what Benjamin Buchlow has called the aesthetics of administration. Uh, I'm showing you works that are not very visual, they're very text-based, which is typical of conceptual art. But I, what I took from it was, I was interested in the examining of the administrations of museums, boards of trustees, and the sources of their wealth, which is what Hans Hacke explored here, um, by looking at the corporate association of the board of trustees of the Guggenheim Museum, um, and the real estate holdings of one of the board members. So looking at where does this authority of the museum come from? And quite frankly, it comes from wealth, the wealth of those board members. That's pretty much how people get on boards of trustees is by having wealth and by having uh, corporate connections. So all of those were sources. Um, and I'll mention two more. One is General Idea, the artist collective of A. A. Bronson, Felix Parts, and Jorge Zantel. Um, from 1969 to 1994, they were based in Toronto. First of all, I love their generic sounding name, General Idea. Um, and I'm showing you works that are part of a project they did in the early 90s. They took a, a well-known image from the 60s, the Robert Indiana Love Design, which I'm guessing most people are familiar with. And they had this placed in New York subways, um, in Amsterdam on the trams. It was placed all over the place as a way of provoking uh, discussions about AIDS, a topic that was very taboo when uh, before the, the drugs made it a more manageable disease. So general idea was another source of inspiration. And finally, I'll mention Grand Fury, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but they were an artist collective that was part of the activist group ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And I'm showing you two works. One, another work that mimics the Robert Indiana uh, print. So again, appropriating an image that's well known and then turning it and making it into something else. In this case, it was done for the 25th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising to remind people that it was a riot that it was not an, uh, an organized protest, it was a spontaneous uprising. And I'm also showing you the uh, fake newspaper they did. Uh, instead of the New York Times, it's the New York Crimes. And it was addressing in 1989 uh, the failures of government and, and the dominant culture and institutions like the New York Times to adequately address the crisis. Um, so they were appropriating the forms of mass media and New York Times, especially is known as the paper of record, all the news that fit to, that's fit to print. So again, looking to so-called legitimate organizations and institutions and transforming them or taking them in a new direction. Um, pop art, the aesthetics of mass production and mass communication, advertising and consumerism were certainly also part of our thinking. So in early 2012, we incorporated um, and we were continuing to plan to make this happen, but we still didn't have a space. Um, Tommy Everett was a designer here in New York who designed our logo for us, which we're really happy with. And he came up with this idea of these boxes with our logo uh, silk screened on it, um, kind of like Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes. And we, were, we did this for this New York Art Book Fair in September 2012. So this was before we even had a store. So nobody had heard of us. Nobody knew what this was. Um, so we wanted the box to kind of signify as a larger institution, uh, as if of this larger institution, this governmental agency, sends boxes around with queer materials to wherever. Um, so we were at the New York Art Book Fair with books and with our propaganda material, uh, spreading the word and letting people know of our plans. Um, we had, by that point, we had a mission statement and a website, and I'll quickly read you what the mission statement was at that time in 2012. The Bureau of General Services Queer Division will be New York City's only queer bookstore and cafe, because at that time we hoped to also open a cafe, uh, which has never happened, but maybe someday. <laughs> Um, we aim to foster a community invested in the values of mindfulness, intellectual curiosity, justice, compassion, and playfulness. 
the Bureau seeks to excite and educate a self-confident, sex-positive, and supportive queer community by offering books, publications, and art, and by hosting reading groups, authors' talks, and performances. The Bureau of General Services Queer Division will provide local and visiting queers and friends with an open and inclusive space for dialogue and for socializing. The Bureau of General Services Queer Division welcomes you. So now that we uh, were, were had our, our mission statement, our logo, our website, um, in Pride, the Pride celebration, which is the last Sunday in June in New York, uh, we went out with a bunch of volunteers on the streets uh, with our our propaganda, our t-shirts, our tote bags, and a bunch of cards and pins. And we were telling people about the plans to open this bookstore. And we were also collecting email addresses. And we sent out a survey to everyone who gave us their email address so that we could get feedback from people in the community to know what they would want out of a queer bookstore um, and to get have some connection with people uh, so that it wasn't just us talking to ourselves. By November 15th, we were able to open as a pop-up shop on the Lower East Side of New York in a gallery called Strange Loop Gallery. And Strange Loop Gallery, which no longer exists, was founded by actually a Dutch woman, Claire Fleury, who is a fashion designer, and her partner, Alicia Exum, who's a photographer. So two lesbian artists who ran this gallery. It was not a queer gal gallery in name, but in many ways it really was a queer gallery given the artists that they show showed and the kinds of art that they showed. So it was great to connect with a space that already had a queer following a queer audience. So we could gain their audience right away. Another thing that we did was to collaborate with an artist named Scott Hug and he pulled together a bunch of artists who agreed to show their work at the Bureau when we first opened, so that each of those artists also brought their audiences. Um, so we were trying to involve as many people as possible. And in the months leading up to establishing the Bureau, we had done a lot of outreach to bookshops. Uh, we did a lot of research and talking to bookshops about what was working for them and what wasn't. Uh, we talked to a number of queer activists and organizations, to queer writers, publishers, feminist publishers and authors. So we did a lot of outreach, but it was also helpful to have all of these art connections as well. We wanted to get as many people from all different kinds of uh, backgrounds to be involved in this project and to take it on as their own. As you can see, it's a very small gallery. It was a very tight space. It was beautiful and Claire and Alicia made it really great and welcoming, but it was tiny. But it was also on the street, which I'll show you in a second, which was really great. So people could walk in off the street. Uh, one of the images I'm showing you here is Sarah Schulman. Um, she's reading from her new book, at the time it was new, Israel, Palestine and the Queer International. So Sarah was someone we worked with from before we even had a space. She was very supportive. Um, and it was really important to us to schedule events before we open so that we could open and say, here are these events that we have coming up that would bring people in. And that's something we learned from so many other bookstores was the importance of doing events, um, that you can't just put books on a shelf, that you need to do events. And as I should say, uh, we never wanted this to just be a bookstore. We knew that it had to be more than a bookstore, that Queer bookstores had always been community spaces, um, and we wanted to continue in that tradition. But also, we wanted to kind of reimagine what that would look like. So again, back to our name, that was meant to kind of make people question, well, what is this? What is the Bureau of General Services Queer Division? Um, so on the one hand, yes, we're, we're part of this tradition of queer bookstores, but also trying to reimagine it. Another thing I want to mention while looking at these images is uh, on the right, I'm showing you the opening reception um, for Strange Loop Gallery. So the gallery that we were in, they continued to do their own exhibitions while we were in the space, uh, which again was really great because it kept bringing in people 
for their for their shows, bringing in their audiences and introducing them to our project. Um, this particular show was called Eclectic Electric Beauties of the Glorious Nightlife. Um, lots of artists who are involved in the queer scene in Bushwick in Brooklyn were very involved with this. So this was a great community event that again brought us a lot of attention. Um, here I'm showing you two pictures, one from outside the space where you see uh, the author and activist Annie Lanzalotto, who is a wonderful New York institution herself. Um, and she and her friend are making some noise, some music outside of the store uh, for a celebration of her new book, L is for Lion, an Italian Bronx Butch Freedom Memoir. So we were on the street, which I loved. That could help bring people in. They could just look in and stop right in. Um, and as you'll see, our, the next spaces that we moved in were not directly on the street. So that's something uh, we kind of missed. I'm showing you a picture on the right of Katrina Del Mar, a New York-based artist, showing some of her short films to just show you that we hosted all kinds of events. Um, they were, many of them were book related, but a lot of them were not. And that's still true to this day. So after almost a year in that first space as a pop-up shop, we moved around the corner. We were still on the Lower East Side in New York. Um, now we were in a space that was upstairs. So it looked out on the street, but you did have to go upstairs to come in, which was not, not so ideal. Um, nonetheless, it enabled us to survive and to continue doing what we were doing, hosting events, selling books, doing exhibitions uh, for another year. And one project that I'm particularly proud of uh, is our connection with, it was a project called Who Lives, Who Dies. And um, I don't know if you have heard of Avram Finkelstein. He's an artist who was part of the Silence Equals Death project. Um, you, I hope you know that image, uh, Silence Equals Death with the pink triangle. So he was part of that collective. He was also part of the collective that I mentioned earlier called Grand Fury, which did a lot of uh, graphic materials for ACT UP. So Avram worked with a bunch of younger activists to do this project and they came up with this sticker. Um, uh, on the bottom, you can see the sticker placed uh, on the streets of New York. So people were putting these stickers all over the place and they had a page on Tumblr where you could see where people were putting the pictures, but you could also read more about the project on their Tumblr page, where they talked more about the colors of the rainbow flag, what they represent, what they've represented historically, and then asking questions. So it was very much in tune with our thinking in being critical of the assimilationist tendencies of the mainstream queer culture. And you can see on top that we projected on our window that that same image so that people on the street were able to see it as they walked by. So this project was very important to me. I'm, I'm skipping ahead chronologically to address the issues raised in the sticker. So who thrives, who dies, whose body matters, whose history survives, who gets policed, who is safe, who is missing, were the questions that they asked. Now I'm skipping ahead two years into 2016 um, after the, there was a mass shooting in Orlando, Florida at a gay club on Latin night that killed 49 people. And after that happened, there was strangely outside of, by that time we were inside of the LGBT community center. And now we had stationed outside of the center, we had police with AR-15 rifles. And it was an AR-15 rifle that the, the murderer used in Florida. Now we had police outside our building with these very rifles. And the New York Police Department suddenly had these SUVs with rainbow flags on them, which was very ironic considering the whole Stonewall Rebellion was against police violence, was against police intimidation. And now they were posing as if they were our friends. Uh, so it was a very ironic moment that really, again, highlighted the contradictions of, of this historical moment. I wanted to also mention that after the mass shooting, our, we had to take out insurance for our space in order to move into the center, and the cost of our insurance tripled 
after the mass shooting. So in the name of safety, we now had police outside with machine guns and we were paying three times as much for our insurance because the LGBT community center was considered now a terrorist target. Okay, so now I'm stepping back into the chronology uh, to mention that it was in October 2014 that we moved to the LGBT Community Center. Uh, so the LGBT Community Center in the West Village of New York City, um, which was historically a gay neighborhood, uh, was founded in 1983. And now we were an institution within an institution. And uh, you can see my partner and I, very excited to see our little logo on the front of the building. But uh, we were on the second floor. We, we are on the second floor of the center. So it requires, whoops, uh, it requires people to go upstairs. So again, not ideal in terms of being uh, visible, but it is ideal in a lot of other ways. It's more central geographically. It's definitely more central culturally because queer people know about the community center and go there for a variety of services um, that they have. They have addiction services, mental health services, physical health services, all kinds of community groups meet there. Um, a lot of activist groups were established there like ACT UP, the Lesbian Avengers. So we were excited and honored to move there and, and kind of embed ourselves within this project. Something I wanna talk about now is that this happened from early on in the project, but more so once we moved to the center. And that is artists, authors um, would stop by and continually still stop by and bring us their work and leave it on consignment with us so that we can sell it through, through the Bureau. So it's very much a grassroots project. We want, you know, we, we serve, the Bureau serves as the infrastructure, but the community provides the content. So they bring in many of the books, certainly not all, but many of the books and the zines, uh, postcards, t-shirts, all that kind of stuff comes from people stopping in and bringing their work. And that's local people, uh, people from all over the US and people from all over the world bring us materials, which is great. That's also true for events that people come to us with all kinds of events. And we try to say yes to as much as possible. We wanna, we wanna say yes to things. That's been our goal from the beginning. Um, and as I'm showing you, the topics are range from anger to comedy to love and burlesque. Uh, so the top image is a comedy night that was actually related to an exhibition that I co-curated with Charlie Welch called The Uses of Anger. So that was about activist materials. Um, we took that title, The Uses of Anger, from an essay by the lesbian activist Audre Lorde, which is a great essay that I recommend. Um, so we've, from the beginning, we've wanted, we've embraced all aspects of the queer community. We like to be playful, we like to be sexy, but we never want to give up our rage at injustice and our desire to fight for a more just world. We've hosted all kinds of events, as I've mentioned, and some of them have become series. So Tell is a storytelling event that we've been hosting monthly since February 2014. So even in our old space, we hosted that. That's where it started. And that was established by an actor and comedian named Dre Campbell. So what she does is she invites three, four, or five people each month to tell a story from their lives, a true story, and she gives them a topic. So every month has a different topic and different storytellers. And it's been really wonderful. It's had a great uh, regular audience that it's built up. And we're happy to have that kind of regular programming. On the left, I'm showing you the Queer Zine Fair, which is another tradition that started at the Bureau as part of an exhibition that we had in 2015. And the New York Queer Zine Fair also became a, a regular event. It became an annual event. It's gotten so big that it no longer can, be, can fit in the Bureau, um, but we continue to collaborate with them and work with them on programs. We've also partnered with many different LGBTQ organizations, including literary organizations like the Lambda Literary Foundation, 
um, also the Publishing Triangle Awards. They've been, we've been hosting a reading of finalists for the awards. The day before the award ceremony, we host a reading by many of the people who've been uh, nominated for awards. So we've been doing that every year. We would have held it this year, but the pandemic interrupted us, so we were unable to do that. But I just want to give you a sense that we, we do a lot of things that are, that are regular, that are repeating, so that people uh, come back to them and they, they build an audience. We've hosted all kinds of workshops, um, one of them being the Office Hours Poetry Workshops, which have taken place on a number of Saturday mornings, um, featuring a different poet who will uh, kind of lead the workshop. And then afterwards, we would have a reading that the general public is invited to. Uh, we've hosted workshops on oral history that we have stood this two-day oral history workshop that people signed up for, uh, which was really great, and also followed up by a public program. And in the past uh, two years, we've been partnering with a local group called the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. And we've hosted so far five courses, these weekly courses that would meet inside of our bookstore. And that was great because it brought in all kinds of people, um, even some straight people uh, who were interested in the topic because uh, the topics weren't always exclusively queer. Um, they were feminists. They had to do with ancient literature, reading the Iliad. So we want to introduce all kinds of people to the space so that people know about it and are invested in it and energized by it. From the beginning, we've also done a lot of off-site events where we've taken the shop on the road. This was especially important when we were a new store and people had not heard of us. So whenever we could go out and uh, uh, you know, popularize our name and spread the word, we tried to do that a lot. Um, so at the Rainbow Book Fair, an annual uh, LGBT book fair, um, Lambda Literary Foundation I mentioned before, we did events with them at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art. Uh, in 2017, we, we took the store, or part of the store, to the New York Live Arts Live Ideas Festival. Um, so you see some photos from that and a performance taking place there. So it's been good to, to help us make connections with people outside of our space and to just spread the word, to let people know that we exist. We've done all kinds of exhibitions at the Bureau. Um, some of them have been group shows, some of them have been solo shows. We've partnered with organizations like Visual Aids. I'll mention some others in a moment. Um, and one thing that we love about the exhibitions is that they transform the space. Every time we have a new show, the space feels totally different and has a different feeling, a different look to it. We also have programs that relate to those exhibitions typically. So whenever we organize an exhibition, we invite the curators to organize some programs. In this case, Visual Aids represents artists who are HIV positive and works to promote their work, to preserve their work, and to preserve the legacies of artists who have died uh, as a result of HIV AIDS. This exhibition featured artists who were still living as well as artists who had died. Um, but we hosted, with Visual Aids, we hosted a number of talks with artists who are still living. Joyce McDonald was one of those artists in the image that I'm showing you there. So they did a, a number of talks that were really great that they recorded and that are on their website. In 2017, we did an exhibition that celebrated the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Lesbian Avengers, which was a lesbian activist group in New York. Uh, it actually spread to different cities around the world. It was uh, a really amazing activist organization. You can see in the photograph that they used to eat fire on the streets. Uh, that's kind of a long story, but I'll just say they, they took circus performance tricks and turned it into activism. They were amazing. Um, and on the left, you see an event. We had a poetry reading with Pamela Sneed, where she's reading. So that's something we also love is that when people are coming in for other events, 
they get to see the exhibitions as well. So there's a lot of cross pollinization where people are coming in for one reason or another and they're getting introduced to something totally different. They came in to go book shopping, but they, uh, they saw this great exhibition or they came to see the exhibition and they learned about a poetry reading that was coming up. Um, here I'm showing you uh, two photos from the exhibition Coney Island Babies, which was presented by an organization called Fire Island Artist Residency. And this was focused on the drag scene, the queer art scene in Bushwick in Brooklyn that I mentioned earlier, and featured a lot of artists who also work in drag. So artists who do drag performance, but also create visual art. And we had some performances related to that. And on the right, I'm showing you a, a queer collage party that we hosted in conjunction with the Queer Zine Fair. So I'm showing you a picture of when the Queer Zine Fair uh, outgrew our space, when it was too large to fit in our space. Now it was somewhere else, but we still held events that were related to that, uh, to that Queer Zine Fair. In 2018, we hosted our most ambitious exhibition ever, and that was called Cast of Characters. And that was organized by Liz Collins, who's an artist who works primarily in textiles and fiber. Liz curated the show, she designed it. She invited over a hundred queer artists to submit portraits. It was all portrait based work. She designed wallpaper for the exhibition, carpeting and furniture. She also brought in furniture by other designers. It was an all encompassing, amazing work of art. We actually didn't, exhibition catalog for it, which I'm really happy about. So that was up for the whole summer of 2018. And that brought us a lot of attention, a lot of press, and uh, a lot of foot traffic, which was great. We were really happy about that. Um, last year, 2019, was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, um, which as you probably know, for many people marks the beginning of the LGBT movement, uh, certainly nationally in the US, but for many people also internationally. Um, certainly there are other important events in queer history, but the Stonewall Rebellion has become a central mark uh, point. So we held a special exhibition that summer called Y'all Better Quiet Down, curated by Nelson Santos and Jean Vaccaro. There was also a smaller companion exhibition that was staged elsewhere at the Leslie Lohman Museum. So again, another collaboration with another institution. And we had performances and presentations that related to that. And that was a great exhibition of activist materials as well as activist art. And it got us a lot of attention. We were even featured in a Dutch newspaper um, based in Amsterdam. What was it called? Volk, De Volkskrant, I think. Uh, so that was exciting, international attention. The Guardian also wrote about us a little bit because there was so much attention on New York for this 50th anniversary. Uh, also something that we participated in and that we helped to promote was a, the Queer Liberation March. So ever since 1984, a, an organization called the Heritage of Pride has managed all the official pride celebrations. And unfortunately, that's become increasingly corporate minded. Um, it gives pride of place to so many corporations, to banks, to politicians, and the community has kind of been placed at the end of the march. Um, so for Stonewall 50, for this major celebration of this uh, 50th anniversary, a new group was founded called the Reclaim Pride Coalition. And they staged uh, an alternative march called the Queer Liberation March. So we totally embraced that. We helped to promote that, uh, to encourage people to join it, and we joined it. Um, and I wanted to briefly read you a statement from the Reclaim Pride Coalition on history and, and why this was important. So I'm reading you their words. The Gay Liberation Front emerged after the Stonewall Rebellion in 1969 and organized the first anniversary march which would later become NYC's annual Gay Pride March. And there you see a photograph of that first 
celebration in 1970. At that point, it was called the Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day. Connecting queer liberation to all struggles for liberation, the Gay Liberation Front believed that our fight against homosexual oppression is one with the revolutionary struggle of all oppressed peoples. That first marches wrote in 1970 went past the Women's House of Detention, where Joan Byrd and Afini Shakur, members of the Black Panther 21, were housed. In an act of solidarity, members of that first gay liberation march shouted, free our sisters, free ourselves, as they marched by the detention center. It is in this spirit of solidarity and coalition that we remember Stonewall and commemorate the ongoing struggles and rebellion of queer people across the world. We continue to work toward our full liberation and an end to the persecution of sexual and gender minorities. And interestingly enough, uh, this past June in 2020, the official Pride March was canceled and was a virtual event. So the official, all the official things that were planned for this year because of the pandemic became virtual events. But Reclaim Pride Coalition decided to go ahead with the plan for the Queer Liberation March in spite of the pandemic. And they did not request police permission, uh, they just did it. And we also helped, the Bureau also helped to promote it this year and we also joined in that. And this year they called it the Queer Liberation March for Black Lives and Against Police Brutality uh, for obvious reasons given what was going on and what is going on in the United States and around the world. Um, so that was a very exciting moment, especially since we had been locked up in our homes for so many months, it felt really good to get out on the streets. Um, so now that we've been shut down since March 13th, not only the Bureau has been shut down, but the LGBT Community Center has been shut down. And unfortunately, it looks like they're going to remain shut down for the rest of this calendar year. Um, so we've been hosting virtual events online and we're gonna keep doing that. And we've also launched an online store um, so people can buy books from us online now. So you can visit us online at bgsqd.com and you can check out the website at bgsq, bgsqd.com slash store. So that's the end of my little talk. I hope you're still with me.